welcome to epg patshala today in this module we are going to talk about ecological economics ecological economics attempts a more holistic analysis in terms of flow of energy and materials that is natural wealth giving non measurable factors proper recognition such as health of an ecosystem or water resources it analyzes resource flows in terms of social metabolism and tends to consider economy as a subset of ecology in this module we will discuss this concept and debates around the concept of degrowth economic growth means the annual rate of increase in nominal or real gdp gdp or gross domestic product measures the monetary value of final goods and services which are provided in a country in a given period of time say a quarter or a year and are purchased by the final user gdp counts all of the output generated within the borders of a country gdp comprises goods and services produced for sale in the market and also includes some non market production such as defense or educational services which are provided by the government the gdp figures are adjusted for inflation or deflation by using the prices that prevailed in some chosen base year so as to get real gdp a statistical tool called the price deflator is used to adjust the gdp from nominal to constant prices ecological economics attempts a more holistic analysis in terms of flows of energy and materials that is natural wealth giving non measurable factors proper recognition such as health of an ecosystem or water resources it analyzes resource flows in terms of social metabolism and tends to consider economy as a subset of ecology as such it is distinct from environmental economics which has evolved as a discipline within economics focused on trying to work out the financial costs of forests and other environmental assets in order to facilitate financial compensation for the loss due to mining or damming in that book ecology and economy quest for a socially informed connection felix padal and his co-authors jiro lunni and ajay dandekar underlines and i quote how more radical environmentalists refer to concepts such as green accounting and eco innovations as efforts to justify new greenfield industries on spurious grounds of reforestation or reduced pollution unquote they also cite an example of the brilliant book green wash the reality behind corporate environmentalism by jed greer and kenny bruno that exposes the use of public relations to create false image of ecologically benign policies by companies notorious for harming ecosystems in the book entitled the environmentalism of poor a study of ecological conflicts and valuation joan martinez elier informs that as per ecological economics economy is embedded in a larger finite global ecosystem drawing resources from and emitting waste into it ecological economists are engaged in developing several material indicators of sustainability they examine how changes in property rights and use of new instruments of environmental policy can help achieve sustainability ecological economics do not believe that there exists a set of ecologically current prices unlike economists who just stick to one criterion to evaluate the value of something ecological economists argue for multi criteria approach to develop a matrix of social interests and values during conflict situations degrowth provides a critic of the current development hegemony degrowth challenges the dominant paradigms of neoclassical economics and also keynesian economics it challenges the centrality of gdp as the most important policy objective and asks for a transformation of production and consumption so as to improve human well-being and enhance ecological conditions and equity on the planet degrowth proposes an alternative framework for downscaling to a lower and sustainable level of production and consumption giving lesser primacy to the economic system so that more space is available for human cooperation and ecosystems instead of efficiency degrowth gives importance to sufficiency the focus of degrowth is not on technology but on socio ecologically desirable arrangements such as sharing simplicity care commons etc according to barbara Muraka degrowth is not merely the critic of gdp as a measure of well-being it radically questions the way social reproduction is intended and frames a multifaceted vision for a post-growth society now we will discuss a short history of degrowth breaking away from the much touted dogma of economic growth propagated by mainstream economists 
politicians and corporate honchos, the use of the term degrowth as a socio-political movement sharpened during the 21st century, particularly in the recession afflicted Europe after 2008. Western scholars argue that degrowth originated from the French term decroissance, which was used mid to late 1970s by writers such as Andre Gauss and Nicolas Georgescu Rogan. In the follow-up of the Meadows report to the Club of Rome entitled The Limits to Growth. That report warned about the limits to exponential population and economic growth in a planet of finite resources. In a concept note prepared for the symposium entitled Growth, Green Growth and Degrowth, held in New Delhi during September 2014, Rajeshwari S. Raina and Julian Thankois Gerber say that certain strands of degrowth could be located in Jesse Kumarappa's model of economy of permanence, which was developed in the 1940s and 1950s in India. During a conference in Montreal in 1982 entitled Le Angeux de la Decroissance, the challenges of degrowth, the French term was used to signify economic recession. The Croissance as a social movement originated in Lyon, France in 2001 and spread to other parts of Europe thanks to degrowth conferences held in France, Barcelona, Montreal and Venice between 2008 and 2012 and a series of international publications. The English term degrowth was accepted at the first degrowth conference in Paris in 2008. Martinez Elier and others inform that decroissance became an activist slogan in France in 2001. Italy, in Italy in 2004, and Catalonia and Spain in 2006. Let's talk about basic tenets of degrowth. Barbara Muraka, in her work, states that the French term decroissance is in its core anti-systemic because apart from questioning some of the basic functioning structures of the capitalist economy, like accumulation, maximization, technological innovation, it critiques the imaginary fundamentals such as instrumental rationality, consumerism, productivity, utilitarianism, efficiency, etc. Degrowth as a concept lies at the juncture of mainly six different streams of thought, each without contradicting or completing each other. It is suggested by Martinez Elier and others that one should not consider the various stream of thoughts on degrowth as airtight compartments. Ecology means ecosystems that have intrinsic value and cannot be seen only as suppliers of raw material for industrial needs. Degrowth proposes to reduce human pressure on ecosystems so that decoupling of ecological impacts from economic growth could be made possible. Communal rights over environmental goods is seen as a strategy for ecosystem regeneration. The second is critics of development and praise for anti-utilitarianism. Drawing lessons from anthropology and various critics of development ranging from Arthur Escobar to Ashish Nandi, degrowth considers sustainable development an oxymoron. Degrowth movement critics utility maximization, which is propagated by mainstream economic theories on market fundamentalism. The social movement on degrowth is about challenging the value systems that is based on self-interest and utility maximization. Meaning of life and well-being. Degrowth critics daily consumerist lifestyle which is followed in all modern societies, proponents of degrowth find that the rise in income has nothing to do with life satisfaction, which is also termed as Easterlin paradox. Degrowth also draws lessons from the association between material gains and emotional disorders. A move away from individual consumption and towards a simpler life is considered as liberating and profound. Bioeconomics Basing itself on ecological economics and industrial ecology, degrowth questions the reliability of technological innovation to overcome biophysical limits and sustain economic growth. Contrary to common intuition, technological progress often increases the usage or exploitation of natural resources. That is also called Chevon's paradox. This idea forms the bedrock of ecological economics. Degrowth sees possibility of non-technical solutions for reducing material and energy flow that lie outside modernization approach. As per the laws, not theories, of thermodynamics, perpetual material growth on a finite planet is biophysically unsustainable. Ecologists term economic systems processes as material throughput, intake of natural resources and output of wastes. Instead of creating just human wealth, and well-being, economic growth leads to rise in entropy, which 
actually implies loss of useful resources. Democracy. Degrowth also calls for deepening democracy, for debating economic development, growth, technological innovation and advancement. There are two opposing camps in this stream. The reformist strand defends the present democracies set up by taking into account the risks of losing whatever has already been achieved. However, the post-capitalist or alternative vision advocates for completely new institutions based on direct and participatory democracy. Justice. Degrowth is also about ending inequality and therefore it critiques the concept of trickle-down which says that economic benefits provide to upper income level earners will help society as a whole. There are mainly two philosophical camps in the justice stream. The consequentialist approach to justice calls for setting a maximum living standard to be attained or opening border between rich and poor nations so that analysis of social classes based on well-being or inequality indicators do not give rise to envy or social conflicts. If lifestyles of rich classes becomes the norm which the have-nots need to achieve for ending inequality, then it will lead to social and environmental crisis. However, if some maximum wealth or maximum income to be earned or owned by someone in the society becomes the norm, then it will weaken envy as a motor of consumerism. The deontological perspective asks for changing the culture of high consumerism and high consumption lifestyle. Another vision within the justice stream is to end historical injustices done by the one community or one country to the another. Degrowth asks for intragenerational and intergenerational distribution of economic, social and environmental goods including basic access to ecosystems. Degrowth advocates argue that Global South should completely give up the current economic system thereby abandoning the global economy. This will allow people in the Global South to become self-sufficient and hence end overconsumption and exploitation of the third world resources by the North. Degrowth strategies and actors. As suggested by Martinez Eliar and others, there are various action strategies undertaken ranging from opposition, building alternatives, that is new institutions, and reformism, that is actions within existing institutions for social transformation at global and local levels. Oppositional activism. There are various modes of opposition and protests undertaken by activists such as demonstrations, boycotts, civil disobedience, direct action, and protest songs. Building alternatives. Instead of taking direct part in protests and activism, Western practitioners promote local, decentralized, small-scale and participatory alternatives such as cycling, reuse, vegetarianism, co-housing, etc. Some actors argue that degrowth should be about changing individual values, tastes and behavior. Reformism. Some actors believe that instead of outrightly rejecting, existing democratic institutions should be defended. Based on the works of Andre Gores, Barbara Muraka concludes that while a reformist reform subordinates its objective to the criteria of rationality and practicability of a given system, a non-reformist reform implies a modification of the relations of power and implies structural reforms. Research. Research is another important uh, criteria to degrowth movement. Experiences gathered from activism can be refined further by academicians. On the contrary, academic concepts can be taken up by the civil society. Various conferences on degrowth held in Paris in 2008, Barcelona in 2010, Montreal and Venice in 2012 have deviated from the standard model of academic conference organizations and used practical direct democracy techniques to discuss and develop policy proposals and research priorities in diverse areas. Scale of operation. Most degrowth activities are taken up at the local level. Networking at the national and regional level is an important part of degrowth movements also. Now let's talk about debates surrounding degrowth strategies. The website Research and Growth, which is at the URL www.degrowth.org informs that due to complex societies, multiple strategies are adopted by degrowth movement. In the first place, there are debates between activist movements which give importance to opposition, for example, movements against infra infrastructures, that is land grabs for big industrial complexes or big dams or nuclear plants, etc. And ones promoting alternatives, that is separate lanes for bicycle, use of public transport, rights of pedestrians, use of solar panels, 
job sharing etc etc there is ongoing contention whether individual action is more important as compared to collective action there is argument whether actions should be taken at local level for national or global issues a big debate is taking place presently which is about degrowth supporters who focus on replacing existing infrastructure and existing institutions that is financial institutions and the ones who consider that certain democratic institutions should undergo suitable adjustments and on the contrary to be defended such as social security there is debate whether practical action in a social movement is more important vis-a-vis theoretical analysis despite these debates and arguments degrowth perspectives is open to diversity and complementarity of strategies let's talk about failure of sustainable development paradigm the brundtland commission had defined sustainable development as and i quote development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs unquote sharad chandra lele in his article in 2013 says that although the original definition of sustainable development focused on meeting needs the operational part refocused on growth that suggests that growth can be trickled down to reduce poverty with the passage of time the meaning of development has been reduced to growth sustainability has been equated with non declining well being and equity has been considered as participation in development decision making one argument that supports the continuation of economic growth is the idea of environmental kuznets curve the hypothesis that with the rise in incomes initially the environment may deteriorate but later it will improve there are also critics of ecological economics and zero growth with capitalism doing enormous damage to the environment in an interview given to Scott Boshert of Monthly Review Press during August 2011 Marxist thinker Fred Magdoff expresses that environmentalists should understand the need for an alternative economic system although there are many ideas floating around to avert environmental degradation one needs to confront capitalism first argues Magdoff in the interview this is because capitalism calls for more and more profit even at the cost of environment without critiquing capitalism one cannot get the answers that why are the global warming chemical pollution soil degradation etc taking place marxists tend to argue that ecological economics does not provide a real critique of the existing economic system and there is no alternative explanation provided on how to organize and run an economy in a different manner in short it is essential to understand that environmental problems are deeply embedded in the economy fred magdoff says that zero economic growth in a capitalist economy is an economic disaster since it will lead to massive unemployment and underemployment of the people as could be noticed during the recent recession in the united states zero economic growth can however be compatible with improved satisfaction of people's basic physical and non physical needs in an alternative economic or social system in such a system production is done only for the purpose of meeting the needs of the population instead of maximizing revenue or profits proponents of degrowth argue that uncontrolled global contraction in the future due to rapid depletion of natural resources will result in much more discomfort and human suffering than what degrowth could do economic growth which is built on depletion obsolescence inequality and waste can further deepen poverty rather than alleviate it says Doug Philipson there are other voices amongst degrowth movement who argue in favor of attaining acceptable level of well-being in the third world nations independent of growth however it is still matter of debate and discussion that by how much the north should degrow and how much the south should grow market fundamentalists criticize degrowth because it can create unemployment and poverty in the society they argue that if non renewable natural resources deplete at faster rate then their relative prices will go up this will compel lesser exploitation and wastage of scarce natural resources when profits accrued from economic growth is spent on research and development new technologies will be invented new technological innovations will lessen use of precious resources newly emerging firms that employ innovative technologies or ideas to reduce wastage and more efficiency will come into being thus creatively destructing or replacing the old and inefficient firms that use redundant technologies has economic growth been of help to india let us look at growth scenario in india as per the 12th five year plan documents india experienced 8% annual growth in real gdp during the 11th plan 
that was spanning from 2007-8 to 2011-12 as compared to 7.6% annual growth in 10th plan that was spanning from 2002-2003 to 2006-2007. With 2011-12 as the base year, real GDP grew by 5.1% during 2012-13, 6.9% during 2013-14 and 7.4% during 2014-15. Most economists, journalists, and politicians in the country today believe that economic reforms carried out during the last two and a half decade helped in pushing up economic growth. The food grain reduction of the country has increased by five folds from 50.8 million tons in 1950-51 to 264.8 million tons in 2013-14, as shown by various issues of economic survey. Food insecurity. Despite economic growth and improvement in food production, hunger and malnutrition still linger on this part of the planet. The report entitled State of Food Insecurity in the World 2015 informs that the highest number of undernourished people were in a state lasting for at least one year of inability to acquire enough food, defined as a level of food intake insufficient to meet dietary energy requirements in the entire South Asia is found in India. That is 194. 6 million in 2014-16. From the same report, one can calculate that around 69.2% of undernourished persons in South Asia live in India. Every fourth undernourished person in the world is an Indian. The state of food insecurity in the world 2015 report predicts that the number of undernourished people in the country is going to rise from 189.9 million in 2010-12 to 194.6 million in 2014-16. The daily calorie norm in India for rural areas is 2,400 kilocalorie per capita and urban areas is 2,100 kilocalorie per capita. From the National Sample Survey report entitled National Intake in India 2011-12, it has been found that the bottom 80% of the rural population in terms of monthly per capita expense per capita expenditure consumed less than 2,400 kilocalorie per capita per day. Similarly, the bottom 40% of the urban population in terms of monthly per capita expenditure consumed less than 2,100 kilocalorie per capita per day. Inequality. Despite some improvements on food security front, growing inequality is a major concern. The National Sample Survey report entitled National Intake in India 2011-12 shows that a person belonging to the top 5% of rural population in terms of monthly per capita expenditure daily consumed twice the calorie as compared to a person from the bottom 5% in 2011-12. Almost the same level of inequality could be noticed in urban areas too. The World Bank report titled Addressing Inequality in South Asia informs that for a typical Indian household among the top 10% net worth could support consumption for more than 23 years. For a typical Indian household in the bottom 10%, however, the net worth was sufficient to support consumption for less than three months. The concentration of billionaire wealth appears to be unusually large in India. According to Forbes magazine in 2014, total billionaire worth amounts to 12% of gross domestic product in 2012. As such, India is an outlier in the ratio of billionaire wealth to GDP among economies at a similar developmental level. Land degradation. It has been mentioned by the State of Indian Agriculture 2011-12 report that about 120 million hectares of land is degraded in India and about 5,334 million tons of soil is lost annually through soil erosion. Out of 120 million hectares of degraded area, water erosion accounts for 68%, chemical degradation 21%, wind erosion 10% and the rest physical depletion. As per the State of Environment 2009 report, excessive soil erosion with consequent high rate of sedimentation in the reservoirs and decreased fertility has created serious environmental problems with disastrous economic consequences. The report entitled State of Indian Agriculture 2012-13 by using estimates provided by Indian Council of Agriculture Research in 2010 shows that out of the total geographical area of 328.73 million hectares, about 120.40 million hectares is affected by various kinds of land degradation resulting in annual soil loss of about 5.3 billion tons through erosion. This includes water and wind erosion water logging, soil alkalinity or so sodicity, soil acidity, soil salinity and mining and industrial waste. 
Besides, water and wind erosion are widespread across the country. Nearly 5.3 billion tons of soil gets eroded every year. Of the soil so eroded, 29% is permanently lost to sea, 10% is deposited in reservoirs, reducing their storage capacity, and rest 61% gets shifted from one place to another. Environmental damages. The State of Environment 2009 report finds that in India, soil pollution from heavy metals due to improper disposal of industrial effluents along with the excessive use of pesticides and mismanagement of domestic and municipal waste is a matter of concern. The 12th five-year plan document has noted the subsidies given by the center and states actually led to excessive use of nitrogenous fertilizers and overdrawing of water, thus affecting sustainability of soil and water ecosystems. Based on a survey of literature, the book Coping with Climate Change in 2014, edited by Dr. Suman Sahai, has noted that at the national level, an increase of 0.4 degree centigrade has been obtained in surface air temperatures over the past century. A warming trend has been observed along the west coast in central India, the interior peninsula and northeastern India. A trend of increasing monsoon seasonal rainfall has been found along the west coast, northern Andhra Pradesh and northwestern India while a trend of decreasing monsoonal seasonal rainfall has been observed over eastern Madhya Pradesh, northeastern India, some parts of Gujarat and Kerala. The government of India has predicted that by the end of the century, average surface temperature in India will be 3 to 6 degrees centigrade higher. The World Bank considers India to be one of the 12 countries most vulnerable to floods, droughts and agricultural damages caused by climate change. It has been predicted that sea level rise would submerge vast areas of Sundarbans apart from delta regions of Krishna, Mahanadi, Godavari and Kaveri. Indian coastline is densely populated and communities on the coast are particularly vulnerable to sea level rise. Groundwater depletion since Nearly 70% of irrigation is dependent on groundwater. Declining water level is a major impediment concerning agricultural production in the country. The State of Indian Agriculture 2012-13 report informs that decline in water level is noticed mostly in northern, northwestern and eastern parts of India in the states of Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan, Bihar, Jharkhand, West Bengal, Punjab and Haryana. Decline in water level has also been observed in parts of Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh. Significant decline in water level of more than 2 meter is seen in parts of Rajasthan, Haryana, Punjab and western Uttar Pradesh, western Andhra Pradesh and north west part of Tamil Nadu. Out of 5,842 numbers of assessed administrative units, 802 units are overexploited, 169 units are critical, 523 units are semi-critical. Social movements as degrowth movements in India. Knowingly or unknowingly, many of the social movements in India against big dams, displacement, deforestation, hydroelectric projects, demolition of slums, manufacturing of soft drinks or mineral water by developing, by depleting groundwater, land acquisition for nuclear power generation or establishment of special economic zones or industrial hubs, etc., resemble the degrowth movement of Europe. One also comes across unique ways in which Activists protest against the dominant system, which ranges from peaceful protests like Jal Satyagraha, hunger strikes, Gherav, etc., to violent protests that include suicide committed in full public view. In the book entitled The Environmentalism of Poor, A Study of Ecological Conflicts and Valuation, Joan Martinez Elio says that there are chiefly three currents of environmental activism. The cult of wilderness, which is the first one, is focused on preservation of wild nature. The second, current, which is confined to the importance of economic efficiency, is concerned with the wise use of resources. Third current, which is basically environmentalism of poor, arises due to economic growth and social inequalities. Poor people who live on the fringes of economy consider the environment as a resource of livelihood. Conflicting situations arise when the expansive forces of capitalists convert hitherto held commons into private enclosures of corporates or when ecosystems are, are irreversibly damaged due to over-exploitation or ceaseless extraction.